Good afternoon, Lisa Homa here. Hope you're all having a great day. Today we're going to talk about the nurse's role in assessing the head and neck vessels. The objectives of this lecture are review inspection, percussion, palpation, and auscultation of the most essential cardiac and neck vessels. So to start, in this lecture we're going to be reviewing all of these things. So in the neck, the carotid pulse, observe jugular venous pressure, estimate how to calculate jugular venous pressure, then we're going to look at all aspects of the precordium. So inspection, palpation, describe the location of the apical pulse, note a heave or a thrill, auscultation, we'll talk about the different parts of auscultation, and there's a lot of stuff in this PowerPoint. You don't need to know all of it. I have it there. It's listed on the course, so if you want to go back and do a deep dive, you can, but we're just going to hit the highlights, so I'm going to be skipping a number of slides because I just want to focus on the most important things. We're going to go through murmurs very slightly and then talk about the apex and the base of the heart. The pulmonary circulation is responsible for carrying deoxygenated blood away from the heart to the lungs and return oxygenated blood back to the heart. There are actually four pulmonary veins that take the work. There's two that take blood from the bronchial region on both sides Let's talk about some position and surface landmarks. The precordium is an area on the anterior chest directly overlying the heart and great vessels. The mediastinum is the area between the lungs and the middle third of the thoracic cage. And things, and they're opposite the way you think the anatomical structures of the heart. I always think the base should be on the bottom, but it's actually the opposite. The base is flipped at the top and where it's located is it, some sources say it's near the right atrium. That is, that is true, but it, where it's really located is between the two pairs of pulmonary veins. And then the bottom of the heart is the apex, and I'm gonna go over the specific landmarks for all those things for you in a couple slides from now. The apical pulse is best heard at the fifth intercostal space, so that's best heard over the mitral area. Heart wall and chambers and valves, because this should be a review for you. But I will point out that here at the bottom is the apex, like I was saying, it just, but if you look up here, they don't even have the base on here, but where it would be, I'm gonna, try. if you see, here are the two left pulmonary veins, and here are the right pulmonary veins, and where the base is, is right here, smack in the middle. This is where it is. So it is kind of near the right atrium, but not exactly. And then this is just a review of blood flow. You will not be quiz tested anything on anything about blood flow but it is recommended that we have it. Here are the heart sounds of the cardiac cycle. This is just a visual. Again, you will not have to know this for your comprehensive assessments just to put things in perspective. And conduction will not be tested in your comprehensive assessment. This is strictly a review. And then the pumping ability of the heart and cardiac output, all these hemodynamic monitoring now that can tell us all these things. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. If you work in IC, you're gonna need to know it, but you won't need to know it here. And here's a picture of the neck vessels, carotid arteries and the jugular veins, history about some subjective data. You wanna know about any types of history with chest pain, dyspnea, orthopnea. Remember orthopnea is the patient's, if they're still in the bed, they'll sleep with three to four pillows behind their back, or eventually they will go to a recliner. You wanna know about a cough. Specifically, a heart failure cough is a dry hacking cough. You wanna know about fatigue or activity intolerance. Can they not walk as much as they used to? Those are all signs of worsening cardiac disease. Do they have cyanosis or pallor? We can determine a lot of things by looking at a patient's skin. If they are cyanotic or have pallor, if the heart is not pumping enough oxygen throughout the system. We have a disruption between supply and demand. The body has compensatory mechanisms for just about every function in our body. And when it senses that we have low oxygen levels, guess what it does? It turns on the sympathetic nervous system and it pumps out epinephrine. If the patient is having an exacerbation or a flare especially, and their oxygen levels are a little bit lower, they're more hypoxemic than normal, they will have epinephrine, we know, Cause is a potent vasoconstrictor, and it will make that patient, when epi's pumping out through the system, it'll make the patient more cyanotic. And you can even see this in a person with different colored skin. Instead of looking pallor or cyanotic, they will look ash colored. Then we're going to look for edema, specifically dependent edema. Look for nocturia, which is urinating a lot at night specifically. And that can be a heart failure. During the day, the patient is walking around and because of gravity, the extra fluid they have on board goes down to their feet. But when they go to bed, 
and they lay down, that fluid will start to creep back up because there's, there's nowhere else for the fluid to go. And so some of it will tip back and the kidneys can pee it off if they're able to. And some of it can go into the lungs while they're sleeping, which is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. We also want to know about past cardiac history. So when I'm putting the patient in a supine position and I'm inspecting them before I do anything else to them, I'm going to look for scars like a thoracotomy scar. They now have more minimally invasive. So you have to really look a lot harder than you used to. You could have puncture marks if they use a robot like the da Vinci robot, or they could have puncture wounds to their groin, which you wouldn't necessarily even see. You should ask the patient to take their shirt off when you're doing the initial inspection. Family cardiac history is a significant thing, especially finding out if anyone, if first degree relative has had an MI or they have passed away and the next generation will need a lot of preventative care to monitor their status. And then personal habits. You could have the cardiac genetic risk, but then what if you're this terrible smoker, you eat really bad, you don't exercise. All those things that we learned from the Framingham study that showed us that our modifiable risk factors are really important in helping us to prevent and and keep d- disease from progressing. All right, so let's start collecting some objective data. Spec the jugular venous pulse and assess what is known as the central venous pressure. In ICU, we call this CVP. It is synonymous with right-sided heart pressures. We want to stand on the patient's right side and have the patient be in a a supine position 30 to 45 degrees with the head of bed angled. Pulsation will be seen at the sternal knot. You want to change position and move the head of bed up even higher and about 45 degree angle, the jugular should start to disappear. You want to inspect carotid pulsations. Remember, anytime you begin to palpate. I know we're not there yet. You want to make sure you only include one carotid at a time. You want to look at the neck vessel exam. Here we're on to the neck vessel exam. So when I palpate the carotid artery one at a time, the strength of the pulse should be a plus two. Carotid artery is marked by two points located at point A and B on your diagram. And they are, point A is at the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the level of the upper border of the thyroid cartilage. Point B is on the posterior border of the neck of the mandible. You want to auscultate the carotid artery. Listen for the presence of a brewery. Breweries are never ever normal. If you hear turbulence in the blood flow, that means something is flowing retrograde or backwards, and it's a blowing or a swishing sound. Apply the bell of the stethoscope at an angle of the jaw, mid cervical area, and the base of the neck. Not have the lung sounds interfere. Have the patient take a deep breath, exhale, and hold while you listen so no sound is masked. And then to look at the jugular venous pressure. In this slide, it says use the angle of Louis. Manubrial sternal angle is the newer terminology for that. Use that as as a reference point and compare it to the highest level of venous pulsation. You want to hold a ruler. So if you just look at the little diagram in B, hold a vertical ruler on the sternal angle, align a straight edge on the ruler like a T-square, just the level of horizontal straight edge to the level of pulsation. You want to read the level at the intersection on the vertical ruler. Normal jugular venous pulsation is two centimeters or less above the sternal angle. You want to state the patient's position. For example, internal jugular vein pulsations three centimeters above the sternal angle when elevated when the head of bed was elevated at 30 degrees and then we're now moving to inspection of the anterior chest and then thing I forgot to mention with the distended neck what two things can you find out from distended neck veins the first thing is you can identify heart failure the second thing is called superior vena cava syndrome I have to say I was unaware of what the heck this was I'm the only reason I found out about it is because my husband experienced it my husband had blood cancer two years ago and had a giant tumor out of his thymus gland in his chest. It was um, 12 by 10 centimeters. It was kind of like a hoagie sitting across his chest, compressing his heart. He was having superior vena cava syndrome and the cardiologist missed it and four other different providers. And he would just have these near pass out episodes all the time. So one provider looked at jugular venous distension, <laughs> distended neck veins or anything. So I mentioned this, that if you see JVD in a young, healthy person who runs five miles a day, please pay attention for their sake. You can prevent maybe the hoagie-sized tumor from causing cardiac tamponade, which is what happened with my husband. We want to inspect the anterior chest and may or may not be able to see pulsations at the apical pulse at the fourth intercostal space at or inside the midclavicular line. Palpate the apical pulse. Person to, to exhale and hold. Use one finger pad and then note the location 
of the, the size, amplitude, and duration. It may not be palpable in adults at all. And then I would recommend that you percuss. Now, percussing the border of the heart, the apex and the border of the heart, is good for a couple conditions. The first is in case you suspect a pericardial effusion. Instead of having like 50 mLs of fluid around the pericardial sac, it'll just accumulate. Long and the short of it is that it eventually causes a cardiac tamponade, which is an emergency. Here's how you should palpate across the chest. You should use the palms of your hands, the aspects of four fingers, or the ulnar surface of the hand and gently palpate. Normally, there should be nothing to talk about at all. It should just have no findings. For a percussion, I already mentioned the auscultating. Most of us know the ape to man. The A should be over top. We're going to auscultate first in that order over the aortic valve region. Anatomically speaking, it's located at the second right intercostal space on the right sternal border. P, so we go to P next. It's the second intercostal space, left sternal border in over the pulmonic valve area, herbs point. It's located anatomically at the third intercostal space, left sternal border. So the one thing to know about herbs point is it's a great place, if you can't remember where else to put your stethoscope, it's a great place to do a quick general survey of the heart. Most types of the heart sounds are audible at herbs point cuspid, which is the T in ape demand. It's the fourth intercostal space, left sternal border, and then over the tricuspid valve area. And the M, there's so much at the M. So over the mitral valve area where the apical pulse is located there, actually that might be a test question also, where it's located is the fifth intercostal space, the midclavicular lines. It's also where the apex of the heart is. So a lot of stuff happening over the mitral valve area. Here's just a, a graph showing where those things are that we just talked about. This is stuff that I'm going to just skip right over. So you're gonna hit this in shadow health modules. Variations in S1, It instead of me talking about it, it will be so much better for you to hear it and then practice it in lab. So we're gonna keep moving. And then again, I'm gonna keep moving with the variations in S2. We're gonna keep moving to a deep dive. And then extra cardiac sounds. This one is worth mentioning. So the pericardial friction rub, the reason I mention this is if you're an ED nurse, the one time where patients could be called an MI alert, you'll get a report and an EKG with ST elevation in all leads. <laughs> and you think, whoa, this guy is having the big one, but actually they are having a pericardial friction rub. And so it's good to know that. So I mention it here, but otherwise we're going to keep moving. So murmurs are, are best heard over the valve that is defective. And and you want to make a note of whether they are systolic or diastolic, and you want to note the, the loudness. And the loudness is graded by one, not so, not so loud, all the way up to six. It's almost like you don't even need a stethoscope to hear it. And as far as the aging adult, you want to know if they have any history of heart or lung disease. Did they have treatment for something? It, it may be resolved, but you want to know about it anyway. Do they have any residual symptoms of that? And then any medications for any illnesses happening now? and then anything from the environment that would predispose them. So even patients who've had certain types of chemos are at a significant risk for developing heart disease later. All history is really pertinent and could impact the CV system. Aging adults, some characteristics is that our blood pressure just keeps going up. What a bummer. We are more likely to have orthostatic hypotension. Our AP chest diameter increases. Now that would be the, the front to back, not this. So the side to side right now is double the diameter. That's the one that normal healthy chest should be and we tend to get more barrel chested. So our anterior posterior diameter goes in the wrong direction. Also, we're more susceptible to carotid artery stenosis and S4 may occur with no known cardiac disease. That's also a complete bummer. So an S3 indicates fluid overload or heart failure, but an S4 is high pressure. So that could be somebody who has hypertrophy or something like that, and that will contribute to an S4. Stolic murmurs are also common. Again, wah, wah, big bummer getting older. Abnormal heart sounds, we're almost finished. Congenital heart defects, we didn't even have to worry about, this sounds so terrible, but when I started as a nurse, most of the kids that were born with all of these defects, these kids didn't make it or we took care of them in the SICU where I work and we took care of them, but they were kids who like, they died. They just didn't do well at all. Or if they came in for a revision, they were just so sick for a long time. These kids are doing pretty well now. So now we have to understand their anatomical changes, how they were born, what was done surgically, and then if they need a revision. But that's a whole specialty in itself, and we're just going to keep moving. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your day.